Thank you, Janis, and uh, good morning to all of you. It is uh, good to be with you this morning. We've just uh, sung a beautiful hymn, Let Us Learn How to Serve, and that was exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples in Matthew 28. And so please turn there with me in your Bibles uh, to Matthew 28, and we're going to read from verse 16 to 20. And um, what we are to serve is uh, we are to serve his purposes that he has for this world. And if we uh, miss out on this purpose or forget about this purpose, we really forget the purpose of the church. The church is to do what God has been doing throughout all the ages, and that is drawing men to himself in worship. And so in uh, Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20, uh, we read that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to his disciples, but do we also read something about the disciples? And we saw that in the first part of this series two weeks ago, or the sermon. I'm going to read from verse 16 to 20, so please follow with me in your Bibles, and if you also keep your Bibles open so that we can follow in the text. It says there, but the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. Commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What we find here is um, a very important and one of the most important purpose statements that the Lord Jesus Christ, where he declares the purpose of the church and their function in this world. The function of the church in this world, according to our text, is that we are to make disciples. And uh, we are not to make converts, just tell Jesus to give their hearts to Jesus, but we are to make disciples, and we are going to see this morning what that means. One of the most tragic things that can happen is when the church loses its purpose for where God has placed it and why God birthed that specific church. And therefore, it is essential for us as Linwood Baptist Church to come to the sticks and to evaluate ourselves, look into the mirror of the Word, and see whether we are doing exactly what the Lord Jesus is, has commanded us to be and to do. I want to remind you quickly just of the parts we've already done in verse 16 and 17, and I want to remind you of the dangers that I have uh, pointed out for you in the beginning uh, of the previous um, part one of this sermon, that so often the church can change its purpose by becoming activists rather than disciple makers. The church can become so so biblicistic or so focused on just understanding the Bible that they forget to reach a lost world for the Lord Jesus Christ. Or some Christians get so drawn in on their experience of the Lord Jesus Christ that they completely forget about what the Lord Jesus has said in this mission statement that we are to make disciples of other people. Or we make the church merely into a social gathering. Now, there are many other dangers that threatens the church, and we have seen it recently in our own church as well. And we need to be very aware of these things, that there are certain things that can hinder us from preaching the gospel. There are certain things that will hinder us from actually fulfilling our mission. One of those things, of course, can be when we are very critical about the church, when we are very critical about our own church. Uh, where we just stand in judgment, where we make ourselves the standard and we measure everyone according to our standard. And we completely forget that uh, God has given us a mission to reach out. And so we become very obsessed with ourselves. And of course, that is a great danger for the church. In verse 16, and uh, I'm going to give you the points that we looked at so that you can be refreshed and so that we can continue with um, <clears throat> the uh, the fourth point this morning, 
if we are going to effectively fulfill our mission as a church, then we need to have three attitudes that needs to be in place before we can be obedient to go and make disciples. In verse 16, if you read there, it says that the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee. They were obedient. They actually made themselves, and the, the heading of uh, this uh, first point was the word availability. They were available to go to the place, made themselves available, arranged themselves in such a way that they prepared themselves to receive this blessing from the Lord that they saw him, that they heard him, that they spoke to him. Now, we applied that and said that if we are going to reach um, uh, out into the, um, a sinful world, that in order to fulfill our purpose, we need to make ourselves available. And the question was asked you, if you remember at Linwood Baptist Church, and even if you're just an adherent, um, are you available to do and to be involved in this great commission. Have you made yourself available? Have you so arranged your life that you would be in the place where Jesus wants you to be? And so here, as Jesus gives this uh, command, um, he gives it to men who were available to do this task. And of course, what are some of the things that hinders us from being available? And of course, pride is the big thing. When we think we've arrived, we only think of preserving the status quo. When I um, don't need anyone else to tell me, um, so I, I, or I'm very focused on my own comfort or my own protection. Uh, I'm not concerned about what goes out there, uh, go on around me. And uh, so uh, I'm only available for my own sustenance. I'm only available for myself. And of course, that's a great problem. But you see with the disciples that they were available men. They made themselves available. Secondly, we saw in verse 17 that they were also men who worshipped. And uh, the text read, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them. And of course, worship is a wonderful thing. Uh, it's the ability to, um, to value and to treasure God above all things, whether it's people or things. And so in order for us to to uh, achieve this goal and fulfill the, the mission of the church, we need to value and treasure the Lord Jesus Christ above all other things. It is so easy for us to, um, to become so self-centered and so idolatrous with and occupied with our own things that we are not really concerned about other people. We are not really concerned whether they're in the church with us or whether they're outside in the world they're being lost forever. And um, so we need to take great care of this. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke about this uh, when he is, uh, spoke about the Jews and he said, you, you worship me with your mouth, but your heart is far from me. Uh, so you are merely giving an outward sense of worship, but your heart, your control center is really focused on uh, away from me on something that you find more appealing and that you are occupied with. And so therefore, it is very important for us when we talk about worship that we expose the deeds of darkness in our own lives because just recently, again, I was in contact uh, with folk who confess to know the Lord Jesus Christ. On the one hand, they say we we worship him, we pray three times a day, we read his uh, his word, but they live in blatant sin. And uh, so, uh, yet they, if you ask them whether they are Christian, they would say yes. Uh, do you worship Jesus? They would say yes, but they have a form of godliness that has no power. And of course, uh, it, when we get blind to that kind of false worship in our own life, it's going to hinder us from um, fulfilling this, this mission. Your pants are crooked. 
Thirdly, uh, in order for us to fulfill and to be effective in fulfilling the church mission, we need to have another attitude. And that is found in the in the verse 18, the second part of verse 18. And that is submission to, to the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we are going to reach the world for the Lord, we need to submit to, um, to him who is in heaven, who has received all authority. Now, what does it mean when Jesus says, all authority has been given to me? Well, when he was on earth during, during his worldly uh, or his earthly ministry, we, he demonstrated his, his authority over demons, over nature, uh, over people who were sick, even over death. He even showed that he could forgive sins. And he was saying uh, 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 in John chapter 11, he was uh, forgiving people their sins. Um, he even delegated power to some of his disciples. And um, uh, so Jesus has this authority. And before he gives the command, he wants us, the church, to know that Jesus is in full control. Everything was made by him and for him and in him all things hold together. But there's a uh, related to our text is this wonderful thought, and it is a true thought, that Jesus also has authority to save to the utmost whomever is going to be saved. Jesus has the uh, authority. He is sovereign over the souls of men. And Jesus wants his disciples to know whenever we go out and we preach the gospel, whenever we go out into the world to declare um, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we do not necessarily appeal and we don't appeal to the will of men, but we know that unless God works, nothing will happen. And Jesus says to his disciples, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And we read about that on various places that um, Jesus is the one who has all authority and the blessing come through Christ. It is given by the Father. The Holy Spirit was given. So whatever work we are going to do, uh, Jesus wants us to know we are doing it under his authority. It's a wonderful thought, isn't it? Which brings us to this morning's point, and it is just part of, of the verse that we are going to look at, and that is obedience. And here we find the fourth element for effectively fulfill, fulfilling the church's mission, and that is actual obedience active obedience to the Lord's command. Now, what is the Lord's command? Um, and we've got to listen carefully to this because so often we think others can go. Uh, I don't have to go. Or there are people who are in ministry that can go. Or they are missionaries. But in this instance, this going therefore and make disciples is given to every single Christian. Whether you're a mother at home, whether you're a grandmother, whether you're a father at work, wherever you are and wherever you are going in this world, this command, and if you're a believer, this command is given to you. Now, the, this is the Lord's command. Obedience to the Lord's command is only made possible when we have this attitude of being available, uh, of uh, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ and submission to his authority. So it was in light of these three things that we've just looked at, availability, worship, and submission, and especially the last one, that all authority has been given to Jesus, that he says, go, therefore. I want you to know the word, therefore, in light of the fact that Jesus has all authority, I command you to go. He has authority over the history of the world. He has authority over every heart of man. We read of Lydia, the Lord opened her heart to understand the things that Paul was saying. He has that kind of authority. 
And so the church is to be obedient to this fact that Jesus has the authority to unlock opportunities, to unlock the hearts of people uh, as we are obedient to the command to go. Look at the command. There it is. This is the fourth thing. We must do this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Now, as I've said to you, this word, therefore, is very important. It is like the hinge that holds the door for the doorpost. Uh, because I'm the sovereign Lord of the universe, because I'm in control, because I have authority, I have authority to command you, my children, to be my witnesses and uh, enable you to obey um, what I am commanding you. So let's look at the word go or the word going. Jesus is saying, as you go, as you live your life, he's talking about a lifestyle here. We don't have a missions committee. We don't have a um, uh, evangelism team. Every Christian is to be an evangelist. Where is it to be an evangelist? As he goes, going, as he goes, as he lives his life as he lives his life before his children, as he lives his life before unbelievers. He's involved. He is always having this attitude that I'm surrounded with people who do not have the privilege that I have of knowing the Lord as, as, uh, as Savior. And so there is this mindset when you stand in the queue at the shop and you look at the people, you think that here are people that unless they are saved, they're going to spend all eternity away from the presence of the Lord. And also, here are people standing here that are potential worshippers of God. And don't we want to bring him glory? So what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying here is that as we live our lives, as we go, as we ride the bus or the taxi, or as we are in the line at the shop or uh, at the post office or wherever we are, we are to have this focus of this command ringing in our ears to make disciples. Now, when we make these disciples, when we do this, we know we are doing it under the sovereignty of God. And um, when we do this, um, we are doing exactly what the Lord has been doing all throughout history. He's been drawing people to himself. And he had people who go, and of course Israel, was given this opportunity and was given this command that Israel's mission was to show them the to be a light to the nations. And they were to be God's light among the Gentiles. And of course, we know that Israel failed um, miserably in their mission. But here God has put up a lighthouse in our community. It is Linwood Baptist Church. We can describe the gospel, we hear it every Sunday, we know what it means to apply it to our lives, and here we are in a sinful world, and Jesus says, as you go, as you do these things, as you drop your kids at, work, uh, 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 at school, as you have their friends over, you are to be this on this mission to make disciples. Now, how do we make disciples, of course, starts with there's something that needs to be in place before someone, and this is part of disciple making, is that the preliminary um, discipleship is preaching the gospel. And when we preach the gospel, uh, we are telling people that this world existed by the will of God. It was designed with a purpose and that man sinned and man falls uh, fall short of the glory of God. And we have incurred for us a judgment. But God is a savior and God wants to save. God is in the business of saving sinners.
and he saves them uh, so that they can live for someone far greater than themselves. Now, in our 21st century, you might say, well, that doesn't sound appealing to anyone. Well, that is why you need the sovereign law to work it out in the hearts of people. You see, the gospel is of such a nature, it is so Christ-centered for his glory and for his praise, that God must be the one saving people. But we know that out there are many false gospels, false gospels that says, come to the Lord Jesus Christ and he's going to make you healthy. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you won't be sick. You must just pray right. Or come to the Lord Jesus Christ and he's going to make you healthy. You're not going to have any need. He's going to make you prosperous in everything. That's not what Jesus commands. Jesus commands that, a, that this mission is to get worshippers of the living God. People who know how they've offended God, how sinful they are, and this great Savior that saves us to himself. And so, my dear friends, in your, in your, this process of going, you are an instrument in the hand of God to preach the gospel. And God will use it. And God will save people. You will plant the seed. Someone else might water. And so we have to understand this. When we go, that it has, that it is God who does the saving. We don't appeal to the, to the will of men as if they have the power to save themselves. No one can save themselves unto such a gospel where you would take up your cross and crucify yourself and follow him as Lord. No, it's only God that, that would make that appealing and bring that understanding and love someone you have never seen. It is only God who can do it. It is absolutely impossible that in our own strength that we can do this. He has authority and he has called us to be witnesses and he has given us power to be this. We cannot be this by ourselves. Therefore, Jesus says, go, therefore, and make disciples, therefore, in the light of the fact that I am sovereign. I want to ask you a few questions. Do you, do you doubt this fact that God can make that kind of gospel appealing to a person that so loves themselves that they want nothing to do with God. I bet you, you've got to understand that, that God is able to save people from that kind of thing. But let me ask you a question. As you go, you see there what it says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Have you made yourself available to be empowered by God? To go. Or do you, you don't even go, you are so scared. But have you made yourself available to be empowered by the sovereign law to go? Or perhaps, let's think about our thoughts. Have you perhaps thought, I wish that God would not expect this from me? Just acknowledge it if it's true, because you've got to again understand, go therefore is in light of the fact that God is sovereign, that he will empower us to do, but we've got to go and he will empower us as, as we go. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Now, what is this disciples that the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about? Well, first of all, he is telling us not, he's not telling us to go make converts. Um, you go and you tell people they're sinners and you might even show them the Jesus film. And then uh, you kind of say a few words, if you want to be saved and not go to hell, then now is the time to come to Jesus. 
uh, it's kind of something that we should be horrified at. People have prison ministries and they have they go to places and this is their goal. I just want you to give your life to Jesus. I just want to get you safe. So once you are safe, then then you're okay. Just say this prayer after me. But that's not what Jesus is talking about in this the text. Um, what he's talking about here is he is saying that we are to make disciples of all the nations. What is a disciple? A disciple is this is the central command and it is someone who believes upon the savior and learns about the savior for the rest of their lives they are learners they are people who hear the truth and then put it in practice they actually are start arranging their lives under their savior i find it amazing something sometimes on um, facebook you have uh, people facing oh there was this evangelism and in india and ten thousand people came to faith now is it possible yes it is possible but my question is was there any discipling afterwards or were people just so scared of not going to hell that they accepted the Lord as their Savior, but they don't know who the Lord is. In some cases, they don't even know that they are sinners. And so as we teach, as we make disciples, we are teaching those who believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's quite a few things that we have to learn in order to make disciples. We have to learn who we are. We are sinners. We are condemned. We are without hope in this world. We are, our hearts make suggestions and we shouldn't trust our hearts. But we also learn about Jesus. And we teach people who he is. We tell them about his earthly ministry. We tell them about his heavenly ministry. We tell them about what he is doing right now in heaven. We tell them how the Lord Jesus is. If you love me, you will obey my commands. We go to scripture and we show people what the Lord Jesus Christ commanded them. So a disciple is a person who has a teacher and who is a learner and uh, he is doing this for the rest of his life. He never arrives. That is a disciple. Uh, for the remainder of his life, his life is spent to come to the knowledge to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which of course is the jewel, which of course is the, the focus, is the Lord Jesus Christ who gives this command. Now, what did the Lord Jesus Christ say? You see this... Uh, this word discipleship is a it's a beautiful combination of two words that that means I believe and I learn. Um, it means that I've come to the place where I trust the Lord Jesus Christ. I follow him as he wants to be followed. And I live continually in obedience to him. Jesus said this. In John chapter 8, 31, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. But you see, what I've just said could be a sting to some of you who listen. Because what we teach people and what we teach disciples is that Jesus, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, is both Savior and Lord. We heard it in our worship this morning. Very often when we listen to people giving a testimony, they would talk about how they were saved. Jesus is my savior. And that is absolutely right. There is nothing wrong with that. Um, but my dear friends, Jesus is more than a savior. 
Jesus is also Lord, which means he's your boss. So a Christian, a true believer, um, believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. And I continue to learn throughout life what it means that he is my Savior and that he is my Lord. He is my boss. He is my great God and my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18 talks about that too. But, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Now, there are implications for, for these things. If Jesus, we believe upon this fact that there was no one else but the Lord Jesus Christ who took our sins upon him, who was imputed with our guilt on the cross, who was punished for our sin in our place, and he gave us, the Father gave us his righteousness, he's our Savior. We are saved through the, the life that Jesus lived on our behalf, and we are saved through the death that he died on our behalf. But you cannot chop Jesus up in pieces. Because there are some people who think, as long as he's my savior, then I'm going to be okay. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says he needs to be your Lord as well. Romans 10 verse 9 says, but if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It needs to be both. And that is discipleship. The gospel is not some cheap little thing that I can belong to. It's, a, it's, it's, it's easily discarded when it's that. No, he is my savior. Yes, he's my Lord. He's your boss. He's got the right to tell you what you need to do with your mouth. He's got the right to tell you what you need to do with your body. And if you say he's your savior, but he's not your Lord, so you don't give him the right to, to say what you can do with your body, and nor do you submit to it, you are not saved. If you only have a confession that Jesus, you are saved by Jesus, but you do not have works that accompany it, you should be terrified. You should doubt whether you are saved. Paul writes to Titus, and he talks about some in Titus chapter 1, verse 16, that profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him. And listen how he explains them, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. They are detestable to him. Jesus also speaks in Matthew 7 about a day that will come where people will worship him. And did we not do this in your name? And did we not do this in your name and prophesy in your name? And Jesus would say to me, go away from me. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. If Jesus is your savior, you do not practice lawlessness. You repent of lawlessness. You're a person who is under the control of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what a, what a disciple is. Another thing that a disciple is, that throughout his life, He's constantly bearing his cross. Jesus said, if you want to come after me, take up your cross and follow me. It doesn't mean the cross you hang around your neck that you buy at Stearns or Browns. No, that's easy. 
Jesus is saying that in order to follow me, in order to be my disciple, you need to crucify yourself and you must make your life all about me. You must live out the desires of me, of another. That is a disciple. A person who is not Christ's true disciples does not belong to him and is not saved. But when a person genuinely confesses Christ as Lord and Savior, and then live that out as reality, he's immediately saved. He's immediately made a disciple. He's immediately filled with the Holy Spirit. Scripture knows nothing about receiving Jesus as my Savior, but not as my Lord. You see, there's actually people teaching this. They actually teach it. They say he's your Savior, but at some later point, he's going to become your Lord. No, you can't chop Jesus up and just say he's your Savior now, and at some later stage, he's going to be your Lord. He needs to be, we are saved through the Savior and the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is how we must teach, and that is how we must disciple. You see, we have an example in Scripture about this. Can you remember the rich young ruler who was uh, this kind of man? He was very moral. He was we can say he was in church. He was very religious. He sang hymns and psalms. He was even generous with his money. And he even admired the Lord Jesus Christ, but he didn't believe in him. He didn't submit to him. He admired Jesus. Because he refused to give up everything for Christ and submit and to submit to him as Lord. He sincerely wanted eternal life. I don't want to go to hell. And he had the wisdom to come to the source of that life. He came to Jesus. He came to the right person. But he was unwilling to give up his own life and possessions and obey Jesus' command to come follow him. I've sat with counselors. I've even sat with people who are not in counselling, but all that kind of conversations. People who are totally convinced that they are Christians. They are totally convinced that they, that they have Jesus as their saviour. But they are stuck in pornography and gaming and stuff for years. That is their focus. And what that is, is they are willing to have Jesus as their Savior, but not as the Lord. You're not going to tell me what to do and how to live my life. And you know what? Christ will not receive you on your terms. He's going to receive you on his terms. He is both Savior and he is Lord. This young ruler was willing to have Jesus as Savior, but not as Lord. And Christ would not receive him on those terms because he refused to be Christ's disciple when the cost was made clear. He could not have any part in Christ or eternal life. He wanted it on his terms. You see, my dear friends, be warned. There's a popular gospel out there who teaches that you can have Jesus as your Savior, but you don't have to obey him. But Jesus was very clear on this. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You've got to take up your cross against yourself and arrange your entire life under him to be your disciple. That is a disciple. Anything else is easy believism. Easy believe believism. That says that the only requirement for salvation is to accept Jesus as my Savior. Then at some later date, 
this saved person that has Jesus as their savior may or may not become a disciple by accepting Christ as their Lord in their lives. So, yes, it's ideal for you to be, to have Jesus as your Lord in that relationship with Christ. Uh, yes, it's commendable, but it is not mandatory. That's not what Jesus teaches. So when we teach, and when we hear the Great Commission and the command to bring unbelievers into the church through preaching the gospel to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is both a Savior and the Lord, that is making disciples. And that's the whole disciple-making process. Increasingly, we, le we learn to hate our sin, God's work, and we hate our sin. We hate our laziness. We hate our uncommitment. And Lord, I can't do this without you. And we come and we repent and we declare Jesus as Lord and we accept him on his terms and we submit ourselves to Jesus Christ. And so the truly converted person is filled with the Holy Spirit that will enable him to do that. He's given a new nature so that he will desire that. He will yearn to obey it. He will yearn to worship the Lord who saved him. And even when the truly saved person is disobedient, he knows that he's living against the grain. He's aware. He has a conscience. What I'm doing is not right. What I'm doing in this. And then he repents and it comes to Christ. Are you a instrument in the Lord's hand of such a gospel? Are you his instrument for making disciples of all nations? Are we such a church? Are we seeking such a gospel to be part of the lives of people and ask the Lord to strengthen us to do just that? Now, let me say this to you. The reason, if any, if any, if a disciple, and when a disciple comes and they buy into this whole idea that Jesus is Savior and Lord, they are disciples. You know what those people are going to become? They are going to become fishers of men. They themselves are going to become disciple makers. And those are the kind of people we want to be disciple makers. Not everyone. We don't just want to go around and say you can all make disciples. The thing is, have you? do you have Jesus as your Savior and your Lord? That's disciple uh, makers. And that is what we should strive at. Because this command is given to disciple makers who have Jesus both as Savior and as Lord. As you reflect on this, and of course what we have here is the philosophy of ministry. And what we have here is the goal that Linwood Baptist, that God has given to Linwood Baptist Church. My question to you this morning, is Jesus your Savior, and is he your Lord? And in order for him to be your Savior and your Lord, you need to repent of your sin. You need to turn against yourself. You need to consider the cost. You need to understand that this gospel that you are saved in is not to make your life prosperous, but is so that your life will declare the majesty and the glory and the greatness of who God is. God is the great one. It is for God's glory. It is for God's benefit that, that we are saved. It is for, for God's purposes that we are saved. It is not for my own purposes. I am not saved so that I can be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. I am not saved so that I can be popular. I am saved so that I can glorify him to, um, that 
to whom belongs all glory and all praise. You are seated in the heavenlies above all rule and authority. And he is to be worshipped. And he is to be submitted to. Let us pray together.